Most of the materials and implements necessary to do sterile and professional piercings can be purchased at your local pharmacy, hospital supply, hardware store, or from Gauntlet. First, let's become familiar with the necessary disinfectants, antiseptics, and antibiotic and anesthetic ointments. Cetylside, a solution prepared specifically for instrument disinfection, comes in concentrated form. It is diluted with water according to the instructions on the label. It is used solely to disinfect the jewelry to be put into the piercing. Betadine, an iodine-based antiseptic, is used liberally to cleanse the area to be pierced. Rubbing alcohol is used primarily for removing the placement marks after piercing or to eradicate errors in the marking process. Bacitracin, an antibiotic ointment, is used to lubricate the needle before piercing and the jewelry prior to insertion. Xylocaine, an anesthetic ointment, is used only in the Prince Albert piercing to anesthetize the urethra. It is not used in other piercings since it is only effective on mucous membranes, not skin. Some of the other materials necessary are a small cup or dish in which you place the diluted cetal side and the jewelry to be used. Ordinary facial tissues are used to apply the betadine antiseptic and to catch any blood that might be present after piercing. A small pair of scissors is used to trim the hair in the area to be pierced whenever necessary. A medium fine point permanent marker such as a Pentel Sharpie is used to make all necessary markings in preparation for piercing. A pair of hemostats is used to remove the jewelry from the cetal side solution. Ordinary corks that have been sterilized are used to place behind the area to be pierced to push the needle into. Latex or vinyl examination gloves are always worn after the marking and application of the betadine antiseptic and prior to and during the actual piercing, mainly to keep the piercer from any contact with blood or other bodily fluids. These may be a bit difficult to find in your area, but check your local drugstore or hospital supply houses or under medical or dental suppliers in the yellow pages. The gloves fit snugly and still allow full dexterity even in the tips of the fingers. A pair of Pennington forceps, which are kept in a special sterilized bag until needed, is fitted with an ordinary rubber band around the jaws of the forceps and moved down over the handles. This allows regulation of the amount of desired tension. Do not use the teeth to provide tension. The rubber band allows for a fully adjustable grip. The piercing needles used are special gauntlet piercing needles. They come in a variety of sizes and are sold pre-sterilized and packaged in a sterile envelope. As long as the envelope is sealed, the needle is sterile. The needle is removed just prior to piercing. The needle is actually a hypodermic needle without a syringe cup, and the design makes it easy to insert the jewelry, as you will see. A pair of inexpensive plastic calipers is used to measure for the size of jewelry for piercings, as well as the jewelry itself. These are available through hardware stores, tool supply houses, and technical school suppliers. An artist's circle template is used for measuring for the size of a frenum ring. These are available at most drafting and art supply stores. An autoclave is used in hospitals and anywhere sterilizing is done frequently. They can be purchased through hospital suppliers but are somewhat expensive. The same results can be achieved by boiling the instruments in a pressure cooker at full pressure for approximately 30 minutes. Many of the procedures in the piercing process are the same. For instance, Jewelry to be used is always soaked in the cetal side solution prior to piercing. Jewelry is dried with tissue before insertion to avoid slipping from between the fingers. Apply a bit of bacitracin ointment to only the tip of the jewelry and to only the tip of the needle prior to insertion. Piercings that require the use of forceps to clamp the area are always backed with a cork in this manner. The first thing the piercer does when preparing for a nipple piercing is to trim any hair away from the area surrounding the nipple. If the nipples are done tandem, the other nipple is prepared as well. Betadine is applied liberally to the area using a tissue. 
The area is wiped applying moderate pressure so to assure the adequate cleansing of the skin. The nipple is pinched within the treated tissue to assure that the nipple itself is thoroughly clean. The process is repeated twice for each nipple. Rings are usually chosen as the initial jewelry because they are easily cleansed during the healing process. The size of the ring is determined by several factors. Does the Pier C anticipate any heavy nipple play in the future? If so, heavier gauge, 14 or 12 gauge, jewelry would be advisable. The inside diameter of the ring should be at least one eighth of an inch larger than the distance between the openings of the piercing. The minimum size for any male nipple piercing should never be less than 16 gauge, one half inch inside diameter. Earrings are never used in a nipple piercing, nor are safety pins, twisted bits of wire, or other materials not especially designed for this purpose. The jewelry must be surgical grade stainless steel, gold at least 14 carat, or other inert metals or plastics such as nylon or Teflon. Sterling silver is not acceptable because it corrodes. The person to be pierced should stand with his hands at his sides. The piercer will sit facing him. Unless the nipples are extremely well developed, the best place for marking and piercing is into the areola, the brown pigmented area surrounding the nipple, approximately a sixteenth of an inch to an eighth of an inch on either side of the base of the actual nipple. Generally speaking, the smaller the nipple, the more the areola is to be pierced and vice versa. The overall width is usually between three-eighths and one-half inch. If the nipple is well developed, the marks should be at the base of the nipple. Marks should be horizontally as accurate as possible. Calipers are used to assure that marks on both nipples are the same width apart. Pinching the nipple top to bottom makes it easier to make light, accurate marks, and also easier to see the symmetry of the two marks. To better define the preliminary marks, or erase errors, a tissue folded into a point and moistened with alcohol is used. Highly visible, tiny points are desirable for precise piercing. After the marking process is complete, the piercee should sit in a chair with his back firmly braced in order to prevent jerking during the actual piercing. At this point, the piercer dons his rubber gloves and clamps the forceps onto the nipple so that the marks are visible along the inner flat edge. In the center, the dots should appear at the same position on either side of the forceps. Here, it is helpful if the piercee or a third party supports the forceps while the piercer prepares the needle. With a cork between the thumb and index finger of the left hand and the forceps in the remaining three, the cork is placed against the nipple and the needle in the right hand is placed on the visible dot. When both the piercer and piercee are ready, the needle is pushed smoothly through the nipple and into the cork, which is removed, the needle pushed through until about one quarter inch of the blunt end protrudes, and the forceps removed. The previously lubricated ring is placed firmly against the needle and slipped into place. Using a tissue to prevent slipping, the ring is closed and the piercing is complete. The entire procedure is repeated for the other nipple.